Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to Target Gender Equality Live, hosted by the United Nations Global Compact. My name is Lydia Cacho, and I am honored to be your host and MC for today's event. Today, we aim to inspire and engage business leaders, young innovators, entrepreneurs, and other stakeholders from UN, government, and civil society to take concrete actions to advance gender equality and break down barriers for women in the workplace, marketplace, and communities all over the world. Over the next 12 hours, we will take a look back at progress made so far reflecting on 10 years of the Women Empowerment Principles, a groundbreaking initiative of the UN Global Compact and UN Women, and look to the future, pinpointing key barriers that must be overcome and concrete actions that businesses can take to accelerate the pace of change. We will then hear from companies that are participating in the UN Global Compact Target Gender Equality Program. Hear inspiring stories of women entrepreneurs from around the world, and learn key ways to address financing for women as we rebuild from the COVID pandemic. Give voice to young professionals on the gender forward policies as that they look for in companies and of course, tackle stereotypes for women in leadership, in leadership roles, and so much more. Through this event, you will hear insights from the UN Global Compact New Global Strategy and ambitions to raise the bar for gender equality across business and business operations and supply chain. The event will also feature the work of the UN Global Compact, including its 70 local networks across the globe, as well as the work of the UN entities and other partner organizations that are working at the forefront of gender equality and businesses. Uh, and you can read the strategy in full and learn more about our global programming by visiting the UN Global booth in the Hoping Pavilion. Well, before we get going in this fantastic event, I want to take an opportunity to welcome you to the Hoping platform and help you get the most of this event experience today. First off, while the main stage conversation will be held in English, all the plenary sessions can easily be translated into both Spanish and Portuguese, in Espanol y en Portuguese. To access the translation, simply stay on the plenary stage. On the right-hand side, next to chat and polls, you will see a translation staff. Click on translations and hit my session. Choose either Spanish or Portuguese. And then don't forget to mute the live video in hoping and you will hear your selected language. Breakout sessions will be hosted on the side stages. The full agenda can be found in the hoping page. So with the tales of the session descriptions, speaker bios and directions to their respective stages. With over 4,000 attendees from 120 countries online today, we encourage you to join the conversation in the event chat room on the right-hand side of your screen and even connect directly with attendees using the networking and people features here in Hoping. We have made it easy to connect with you fellow attendees. Uh, you can see them in your attendee tab, also on the right-hand side of your screen. That's where you can send private messages and even invite them for a video chat. The networking section is in the navigation bar on the left side of your screen, and it enables you to chat and even connect over video with other attendees and make new connections. You can even share contact information, give it a try. You might take new friends from here Head to the pavilion to explore the content studios. 
featuring work from our event sponsors and partners, and Mentorship Lounge, where you can hear practical advice and personal stories from over a dozen impactful leaders. You can also learn more about the UN Global Compact and speak to our team in the UN Global Compact booth. And of course, you can keep the conversation going on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn using the hashtag target gender equality and gender equality. Tweet your questions and comments out about the event, and I will check in on your tweets through the program. Registration in Hopin will remain open through the day, so feel free to share your excitement on social media and invite your colleagues to join in. Lastly, if you need to step away for a bit, don't worry. All recordings will be available on our YouTube page shortly after the event. We have an exciting day ahead of us, so let's get started. To kick off our Global Welcome Plenary, we will first hear from two members of the UN Global Compact Board to reflect on why gender equality is a business priority, how to accelerate the pace of change, and how women's leadership can kickstart progress on a range of sustainability development priorities, including, of course, climate change. So please, Join me to welcome Musimi Kanyoro, board member and senior global advisor to the UN Global Compact, and Paul Pullman, vice chair of the UN Global Compact board and co-founder and chair of Imagine. Musimi, Paul, over to you. Okay, here we go. Well, thanks, Lydia, and welcome everybody to this webcast. We're certainly honored that you've joined us. We're here to take stock of progress and reflections on 10 years of the Women Empowerment Principles, a groundbreaking initiative of the UN Global Compact and UN Women. And nobody better to kickstart the conversation with than uh, Misimbi uh, Kanioro, who is also a board member with me of the United Nations Global Compact and the former president of the Global Fund for Women. Musimbi. We're meeting during the 65th session of the Commission on the Status of Women. That's the global intergovernmental body dedicated to gender equality and the empowerment of women. For a two week period in March, UN member states, civil society organizations and UN entities convene to discuss progress and gaps, most importantly, in advancing gender equality. As a human rights activist, who has worked with grassroots and international organizations around the world to push for change. What are your perspectives on how far we have come and obviously how far we still have to go? Thank you very much, Paul. And indeed, we're looking forward to having 8th of March because every year 8th of March brings men and people from all over the world really focus what the status of women are in the world. And what is really important here is that in Beijing, a new movement of leader of women was um, ignited. And that really spread throughout the whole world. And at this particular time, this is realized through the generation equality, which the UN Women is leading. And uh, the celebrations that we want to have for the 25 years after Beijing really include um, bringing the young people, maybe young people who are not there in Beijing. And what I have seen is uh, a, a participation of young people, knowledge that young people are bringing to the table, new issues that young people are bringing to, to, to the table, including right now, all of us are all, all also focused on the impact of uh, the COVID pandemic on women. And what we see is that um, while we can really keep our eyes focused on the positive things that have happened to women and to the girls and to the society, to know, for example, that child mortality is much better than it was 25 years ago, etc. Et we really also have come to the reality that whenever there is something that puts women in a vulnerable situation, that vulnerability expands to the highest 
And so we see today, Paul, a lot of vulnerability that are happening to women. Some of the achievements that we had um, ach uh, achieved over these 25 years being challenged, supposedly not wiped away, but really being sufficiently challenged for us to worry about. But I believe that society and specifically women will remain focused to campaign um, and to make people aware so that we can continue to focus on bringing solution to these issues. You mentioned, uh, Musimbi, rightfully so, that COVID has not been a good friend once more for women and girls, if you want to. In fact, the statistics would say that women are 1.8 times more vulnerable than men to job losses during this crisis. They make up uh, 39%, I believe it is, of global employment, but they accounted for 54% of the job losses. And that's obviously one of the reasons for that is the enormous burden that women still have in the unpaid care sector, which is disproportionately affected. Now, in a business as usual scenario where no action will be taken and we stay on, on the current trends, if you want to, then the economic opportunities that we miss will be about $1 trillion. Uh, but conversely, if we start taking action and drive gender equality, we could actually grow the global economy between now and 2030 by over $13 trillion. And that is obviously a badly needed boost. So there is an overall economic reason why business should get involved as well. But besides that, we also see that um, for businesses that are more gender diverse, we also have these businesses significantly better perform. Uh, over a decade ago, I believe it was that UN Global Compact and UN Women joined forces to launch the women empowerment principles. And it's worth looking at if you're running a business. It outlines a range of ways that business can ensure respect and support for women in their workplaces, across the value chain, obviously in the communities in which they operate. And their commitment is clearly in place uh, with this uh, principles, as over 4,000 CEOs have signed. So if you haven't signed yet, now is the moment that, uh, that you can sign up. But it is fair to say that progress has been slow. At the current rate, it will take 257 years to reach gender equality. And we all agree that we cannot change, uh, cannot wait that long. So I would argue that all businesses need to start to incorporate uh, first and foremost, gender equality in their own business. Um, not surprisingly, research has shown that gender diverse companies from executive level down have a significantly outperformed their peers and have also higher value creation. Not surprising because of a stronger representation of the leaders that they have, they're more productive and innovative, better at problem solving or avoiding risks. And, they, and of course, they're able to draw on that broader knowledge and experience. So very important now that the private sector embraces that. But Musimbi, are there any reflections on your side as a senior global advisor of the UN Global Compact's uh, target gender equality program on what needs to be done on setting or meeting the concrete targets to have this progress that we, that we are looking for? And how can we actually create an enabling environment for gender equality uh, to thrive. What are your experiences and what would be your suggestions? Paul, well, we're very excited, those of us that are working on Together Gender Equality, because a number of companies have joined um, this, uh, this journey and they have joined realizing that if we have to make, we don't have time, we don't have time to wait for those years that you have mentioned, 257 years, we don't have time. It's urgent. And one of uh, the big contribution that uh, the Global Compact is uh, providing to the rest of the society is actually bringing the visibilities of what companies are doing and can do. We know it's a long journey, but we know that it is important. The Target Gender Equality Program, it puts it, what it does is that it puts women's empowerment principles into practice with the focus on women's representation in leadership in business. And we know that when women are on the boards, when women are on senior staff, when women are part of making the decisions that affect the, uh, the company and the society, we get to a, a better place because that's exactly what we are trying to do. We are focused on generating tangible, measurable results 
and measuring them because if we care for something, then we will measure it. We are interested in running, in supporting those locally run collaboration of the global company net networks. And it's really exciting when you hear the networks um, sharing the successes they have made, but also the challenges. So we know that since its launch, as you know, Paul, over 300 companies in 19 countries across all the regions have joined this effort. And that's really what makes us excited um, to continue to build on together um, uh, gender equality. No, oh, that's encouraging. And I think you mentioned two things, if I may say. It's the first one is the challenge that we have is so big that it needs all stakeholders to be involved. But most importantly, that companies also need to step up being more diverse. And uh, only uh, less than 17% of boards uh, seats are actually held by women. 5% uh, of board seats are, uh, of, of chairs in boards are women. Uh, still 20% of the Fortune 200 companies have only all male boards. So we have our jobs cut out. And perhaps the first thing that companies can do is to just ensure that their own boards are uh, gender uh, diverse before they actually uh, start to work on their value chain and the broader act advocacy and system changes that are needed. It's perhaps also important to recognize if we move on, that gender equality should not be a goal in itself, but it's also a catalyst, or I would call it a driver of change for sustainability. A gender balanced leadership is not only good for business, I believe it's actually critical to give us the best chances of solving the world's most pressing challenges. And you referred rightfully so to the uh, sustainable development goals, but we've seen it also from climate change to COVID. In fact, uh, Bloomberg uh, just did a study that said there's a clear correlation between gender diversity, climate performance, and innovation. An that analysis of about 12,000 companies around the world found that one third of the board, uh, if, if there were one third or more women on the board, they're also likely to outperform against the sustainable development goals. And um, mm -hmm. yeah. climate change is probably the biggest one. You've mentioned that disproportionately affects women and children, and, and yet when we try to find the solutions, they're not well represented around the table. So hopefully in the corporate boardrooms, in governments, where we, in the, in the COP and the negotiations that we do there, we need to be sure and, and critical that we have a gender balanced representation. And I know you're fighting for that. Do you have any other reflections? And in addition to representation, Paul, yeah. In addition to representation, part of the really big effort is to ensure that there is um, a, a good, strong attention to human rights uh, in our gender work, and especially to the rights of women. And the rights of women include being sensitive to the life cycle of women. Many women take care of families. Many women are employed in the sector of uh, um, our, our industry that um, uh, is heavy loaded with um, sometimes repetitiveness, sometimes um, danger that can um, endanger even the reproductive health, et cetera. We urge companies, we urge companies to be inclusive in bringing representation of women, but to be sensitive also to the health of women, to be representative to the human rights of women, and to be representative to the fact that um, sometimes jobless, uh, job loss affects those sectors specifically where there are more number of women than, um, uh, than, than men. And no. sensitivity that takes into account what we real mean when we say that we want to work on gender can be a very good thing for the companies uh, to look at. Yeah. Now on the final question, you've had such a success with the Global Fund for Women and uh, tremendous um, uh, impact uh, globally by investing in women, as we all know. And, and what are specifically these leadership skills in these uh, challenging times that we now have that we should be looking for in women uh, to give them that uh, deserved seat at the table? Uh, when women come to the table, they come to the leadership, first of all, as human beings, human beings who have got ability to, have, to be innovative, human beings who are used also to doing um, things, many things at the same time many things, who can really multitask as a part of what they have learned to, to do over time. 
but also women come to the table as people who have had similar education uh, as men. And uh, so when they come, they bring the leadership both of what, it, what their own uh, upbringing, their own raising, their own um, abilities to the table in the, in the leadership. But they come to the table also with uh, what many studies have shown, with the ability to look at a larger society, not just for the, an individual company by itself or their individual leadership, but really to look at the social issues that impact society, because it is people who make companies successful. It is people who actually make the world a better place. And women come in with bringing both the, uh, the, the importance of uh, the, what we need to do as companies in order to make um, a profit, in order to make products that are uh, good for society, but also to bring along the human rights and the um, and, and the, the importance of also bringing in the next generation of leaders to the table. This is part of what we are interested in uh, at the Global Fund for Women. And I do want to urge financing these things is important. Financing ability for women to be at the table is important. It's not words alone, it's actions. And actions, are, as we say, uh, speak louder than words. Thank you so much, Musimbi, Kanyoro, and Paul Pullman for those inspiring remarks. Thank you, for, Paul, for reminding us how many women have lost their jobs to the, due to the pandemic and what we, we can do to change it. So gender equality is a truly global challenge, which calls for worldwide solutions together with local actions. Through the day target gender equality life would look at priorities, opportunities, and challenges from across the globe. Next, we will hear from gender champion from India, Kenya, and Italy to share their top gender equality priorities and share regional perspective. First, we will hear from Vaishali Nigam Sinha, Chief CSR Sustainability and Communications Officer of Renew Power for her experience and thoughts on specific challenges, solutions, and innovations out of India and South Asia. Take it away, Vaishali. Thank you. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Uh, to all the dignitaries and co-speakers. Uh, it is truly an honor to be speaking at this global platform, uh, the first annual Target Gender Equality Summit live. I would like to thank the UN Global Compact Network for giving me this opportunity to talk on this very critical topic and throw light on you know, what and where India stands today to achieving some of these very, very critical goals we have. I would like to reflect on the challenges that persist and solutions, right? And how as a community we can collaborate and innovate and identify solutions to advance the agenda of SDG 5 by 2030. I would like to congratulate the United Nations on the progress on SDGs and agenda 2030 made so far. It's really commendable. It's really driven all of us in the various countries in different parts of the world towards a common goal. I believe that the sustainable development goals are truly a landmark in the history of our inclusive and global sustainable development agenda to construct a world which is a better one. So once again, thank you for doing what you're doing, for leading the way you are. Uh, let me start by talking about India, given that's where I sit as we speak. Um, I would like to segment my comments in three distinct buckets. What are the positive developments over the years? I think it's very important to take stock of that. What are the critical challenges which we need to address? And what is the action plan to advance this journey here in India? Let me start by the positives. I would like to begin by acknowledging the various steps that have been taken to bridge the gender divide in India, sometimes we lose sight of what we have done so far. Under the leadership of our Honorable Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi ji, women, women have been at the heart of India's development agenda, centered around 
sabka saath sabka vikas together with all development for all over the last few years our vision for development of women has changed to one which is a women led development through impactful programs focusing on women's education health financial inclusion entrepreneurship and a lot more um save the girl child educate the girl child are some of the programs which have done well which have increased the enrollment ratio of girls at high school which is critical uh from 77% to 81% not a big step but a step in the right direction the jandhan program the largest financial inclusion program in the world so opening of approximately 400 million bank accounts 55% of which are held by women all of these have had a tremendous impact to accelerate the socio economic empowerment of women which all of us want to see in india so as we accelerate our journey to meet the 2030 goals it's important that we take a moment to reflect and acknowledge some of the steps which have been taken in the right direction and i really want to acknowledge on this platform that this would not have been possible without all of us working together from new york to new delhi to the you know the most rural part of our country the engagement has been in the right direction let's talk about challenges now because while we acknowledge what's been done the challenges are numerous so if we look at the challenges we look at some of the reports which are very re reputable reports so the world economic forum has come out with some reports where the statistics shared are pretty uh jarring we need to look at that we need to ensure that the labor part force participation in india is primarily unpaid we need to change that uh we have very few women ceos we need to change that we need many more women on boards we all know this we have to make this happen and we are working very hard and tirelessly to make it happen in india so i think as we come together the corporate sector the cso's international organizations let's focus on capacity building ensuring access to affordable education gender budgeting and all of that it's critical for us to do better uh, when it comes to getting women ahead um so once again thank you so much for this opportunity and um, i'd like to wish all of you the very best for this conference i'd like to conclude by saying that the first um women female president at the united nations general assembly was vijay lakshmi pandit she inspires each of us here in india to do our best we owe it to ourselves to ask for what we want and be prepared to get it thank you thank you so much vaishali it's great to hear about the work you're doing and the innovations that can be scaled globally Next we will hear from Jacqueline Mugo, Executive Director of the Federation of Kenya Employers, on her experiences and insights on regional challenges, innovations and solutions from Kenya and African Union. Jacqueline, over to you. Thank you very much and warm greetings to you all from Nairobi, Kenya, the city in the sun. Thank you for the privilege of sharing in this important conversation to share with you what employers and businesses doing in this important area and some of the lessons and challenges that Kenya is facing. Kenya has made significant achievements in promoting gender equality in all aspects of economic, social, cultural and political life since the Beijing Platform for Action 1995. Our progressive constitution which was passed in 2010 contains a bill of rights that is fairly expansive and advances gender equality freedom from discrimination and women's empowerment the constitution therefore envisages equal participation of women in leadership at africa level the africa agenda 2063 goal number 14 also emphasizes full gender equality in all spheres of life so african countries aim to empower women and girls and provide equal access and opportunity in all spheres of life to end all forms of violence and discrimination against women and girls and ensure full enjoyment of all their human rights 
But despite these provisions, we know that this is not the reality. Most countries in the continent have not achieved gender balance, and few have set or even met the ambitious targets for gender parity 50-50. So women's equal participation in leadership and other spheres of life is low. Unfortunately, women, children, and youth, whom we have in large numbers in Africa, are also the most affected in times of a crisis such as the pandemic. So COVID-19 heightened the urgency to act on specific gender challenges in Kenya and Africa. Among these challenges are access to healthcare, only 58% of women, less than 58% of women who sought healthcare could get it. There's vulnerability of the girl child, they have low access to nutrition, the risk of early pregnancies increased during the pandemic, as we have seen, and also there's been a sharp increase in, an increase in gender-based violence. So what has business done? Business has worked within the frameworks of the UN guiding principles to come up with policies that match the commitments in the principles. So as a business member organization, my leadership and that of my board is to ensure that our members have in place policies that promote fair labor practices in line with the UN guiding principles and also SDG goal number five, which aims to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. We have the Employer of the Year Awards, which is done annually to recognize best practices by business, those that are more inclusive of women, those have, who have promoted women into higher levels in the corporate world. We run programs that aim to promote sexual reproductive health rights and gender equality at the workplace and a wide range of policies influence to ensure that the policies that we have, collective bargaining agreements, include equal pay for women. We also work very much in line with EPIC, where the International Organization of Employers participates. The International Organization of Employers, which I'm honored to serve on the board of, is committed to tackling gender-based discrimination in pay as outlined in the Equal Pay International Coalition, EPIC. At the global stage, it was also my privilege to co-chair the 100th session of the International Labor Conference, where a landmark instrument on elimination of all forms of harassment and violence at work was passed. And this has informed the work that we do to help companies come up with re relevant policies to, to promote gender equity. What examples can we run from Kenya? Kenya has done a lot using the cooperative move movement to bring women together, to form small cooperatives, small groups that are called chamas, their groups, and over 300 of these chamas exist that currently dispense around 300 billion shillings to empower women because we know that economic empowerment is everything. Looking forward, the FKE seeks to scale up the Female Future Leadership Program, which we have run for the last eight years, that aims to build the capacity of women to take on leadership positions in the corporate world. Through this program, about 400 women have been trained, a lot of them have risen to senior level positions in the corporate world. They've taken leadership positions in the political field and in their social spheres. And it is our objective to increase and to scale up this program so that we can have women who are ready to take up positions and make a difference in the world where they work. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. And how important it is uh, to eliminate all forms of harassment, and just, as you just said. So finally, we will turn to Europe to hear from Francesco Starace, CEO and General Manager of NL and UN Global Compact Board member. Take it away, Francesco. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak even in a recorded message. I want to start uh, underlying what is the uh, specific and, and most important challenge that we're facing uh, in, in Enel. Enel is, is a utility we're working in, uh, in many parts of the world, uh, more than 30 countries around uh, different continents. But we have a common problem. The common problem of the industry in which we sit is that we have a percentage of uh, women working in our uh, industry, which is uh, quite low. It's around 30 percent. And, and this is, uh, in my opinion, the biggest challenge we're facing um, to have 
a more uh, balanced mix uh, of gender in, in the industry. The principles which we're trying to, to follow are those that, um, that guide us in this, uh, in this battle, are those that are embedded in the women empowerment uh, principles. So, so the seven guiding uh, principles that we are trying to have as, um, let's say, framework in order to advance in this, uh, in this battle. And uh, if, if I can say, one of the most important um, initiatives that we are focusing on today is uh, starting bottom up uh, and having programs in all different countries in which we work that encourage young girls, women, to embrace the STEM courses in their university. So science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Without doing this, without having a broader uh, percentage of women uh, into these uh, disciplines, it will be very difficult to grow the number of uh, um, employees that, uh, and colleagues that are women in our organization. You know, the energy transition needs everyone. This is a, an incredible effort if we want to decarbonize the economy of the world. And we cannot do it without a higher percentage of women engaged in this. It requires a different way of thinking. It requires a completely uh, new set of skills and capabilities also at management level. Traditionally, it's not only the fact that companies have percentage of women that uh, many times are not at par with men, but as you go up in the in the organization, that percentage shrinks, does not grow. And it takes an, and it takes an effort to, to make it sure that this doesn't happen and it goes the other way around. That's what we're doing in the company. So in general, we are, we're encouraging young women to embrace uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics courses in order to prepare for a larger number of uh, colleagues that enter the company and balance the overall a hired um, gender um, mix, but at company level, we are having a targeted effort on salary equality and a specific effort in growing the manager uh, percentage of women in the manager in the managerial levels of the company. I am extremely happy to be able to uh, explain a little bit what we're trying to do. Uh, we are a large company, but in the context of the world, a tiny part of it. And we think it is extremely useful to hear also experiences from others. The global company is a very large environment. There are many, many different experiences. And we are curious to understand if uh, we, can, we can shorten our way to equality thanks to the experience of others. So great opportunity to be with you and uh, extremely interested to hear what's, uh, what's, uh, what's the story in the next uh, few hours. Bye everyone. Thank you so much, Francesco, Jacqueline, and bye Shali for your unique perspectives. And of course, yes, Francesco, we need more girls and women in the science, technology, and engineering world. And I'm sure um, together we will get there. So uh, now we will move into our first set of breakout sessions. Over the next two and a half hours, we'll deep dive on basis and backlash against gender equality, integrating gender into ESG investing, scaling businesses ambition for women empowerment in the Middle East, human rights due diligence through a gender lens, and how the blue economy can advance goal five and much more. For all those sessions, descriptions, and their respective session rooms, please see the program agenda on the homepage. And don't forget to head to the Mentorship Lounge in partnership with Vital Voices to hear practical advice and personal stories from impactful, amazing leaders. So grab a cup of coffee, explore the pavilion, deep dive into breakouts, and join us right back here in two and a half hours. See you soon.